Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Archaeopalooza. My name is Nikki Woosley. I'm a volunteer with the Desert Institute at Joshua Tree National Park Association. And I'd like to present our first speaker, Joan Snyder. Um, she's going to be talking about the life and legacy of Elizabeth Warder Crozier Campbell. Um, so without further ado, welcome Joan. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Desert Institute for inviting me. Um, I'm going to try and do this talk without any notes and rely on my slides to sort of prompt me. Um, if you have questions or you want to know more about something, it will, let's wait till the end, and uh, I will give you a chance to ask as many questions as you would like to do. Okay, so this morning, I'm going to talk about Elizabeth Campbell. I bet you that everybody in this room knows about Elizabeth Campbell, right? So what I'm going to try to do today is to um, make you aware of why she's so important. Now, she's not important because of all those collections up at the Visitor Center and in the curation. In the, um, in the discipline of archaeology, she's quite important for another reason. I mean, in her day, it was quite the thing for folks to go out on Sunday in their cars, because cars were relatively new, travel the roads, look for sites, collect artifacts from Indian sites, and either keep them in their homes or donate them to a local museum. That was like you know, the Sunday activity that for a lot of folks, particularly if they lived in desert areas. And this is part of what she did, but it's not the important thing that she did. So let's start. So Elizabeth Campbell lived for many years in 29 Palms, but her early life was much different, and I'll talk about that a few minutes, for a few minutes. But basically, I want to focus on um, why, uh, how she revolutionized archaeology. So the three points I'm going to make are what is her contribution, um, how did it happen, and what makes it enduring. And this picture is a very common one. It's a picture of her outside her home in 29 uh, with a large Oya, and the man standing next to her is Edwin Walker, who she hired away to help her. And he was uh, not a trained archaeologist, but quite knowledgeable, and he worked at the Southwest Museum. So she hired him away to come and live up in 29 and help her with her work. This is a short synopsis of Elizabeth Campbell's life. She married her husband, Bill, in 1920. I'm not going to talk about that and other circumstances, but only going to focus on her later work. So they arrived at the Oasis through a series of circumstances in the winter of 1924. And, um, uh, they, when they would go out and they lived at the Oasis for a while while they tried to um, achieve ha being homesteaders, and because the Oasis, of course, was one of the few places where water was available, and most people, who, most Europeans who came, and Native Americans who came to the area, um, started at the Oasis because that's where the water was. So she and Bill lived, uh, camped at the Oasis, and they would go out and they would collect um, fuel, wood, in the dunes and around the countryside for their fire, for their campfires. And while they were doing that, they started to recognize uh, artifacts on the ground all around, and they started to collect. So uh, they did that, and eventually they did get their homestead, and they built a little homestead cabin. And um, 
um, then they began very, very much interested. You know, they had, you know, they had a lot of time to fill. So the recreation and the interest of these two people, as well as other people in the area, was to go out and look for artifacts on the countryside and on the landscape. So Elizabeth was a very, um, uh, I could say, uh, she was the kind of person who was used to recording everything. She was very meticulous and very thorough in all her writing. And this is a trait that was carried on from her childhood, where she wrote poetry to describe surroundings. So she also kept meticulous notes about where they, they found artifacts, what they found. And this was without any training. So uh, these uh, journals that she has, or field notebooks, are also archived in the collections at Joshua Tree. And it's really a delight to read them. And uh, I give her a lot of credit because one of the things that um, professional archeologists uh, worry about today is people who collect and don't keep any records about where they found things and the circumstances under which they found them. So she was a very early practitioner of keeping meticulous field notes. So I guess she decided she was going to be an archeologist with no scientific education and no formal training in archeologists. But the one thing she did have that most archeologists didn't have is money. So later on in her life, she was a recipient of trust money from her family who were industrialists on the East Coast. So she was able to wiggle her way into the professional archeological community by having the funds to hire people, to create exhibits, to create her own museum, and to finance expeditions that she and her husband Bill, along with their friends and associates, would go out for weeks at a time on the countryside, and they would go out and survey and collect artifacts. So she also grew up with an attitude that she could do anything. And she had no hesitancy about calling the, um, the uh, head of the Department of the Interior on the telephone, or the archeologist who was the national archeologist at that time, and asking for their help or their direction, or their permission to do so and so. So she sort of had this self-important attitude, which absolutely helped her along, besides the money. Um, by the time 1932 arrived, and this is so 24 to 32, that's eight years after they arrived and camped at the Oasis, they were able to establish, establish themselves enough to be host to a conference in 29 Palms. And not only did locals attend, like local people are coming here, but she also had very, very well-known and well-established archeologists from the Southwest Museum and elsewhere attending this conference. After the conference, she went on and she and Bill discovered the dry lakes and artifacts around the dry lakes in the, in the Mojave Desert and dry lakes elsewhere. And also along the rivers like the Owens River and the Colorado River and Pinto Wash. And they began, she began to think and what she thought was This is, all these photographs, by the way, are Elizabeth Campbell's photographs. And these are also archived at Joshua Tree National Park. So these are all photographs that they took. This photograph is of their early collecting days and digging days. And I think it's really interesting that they're using garden tools to do their excavations. 
It's like, uh, you know, like garden trowels and rakes and regular shovels. So, and they, of course, didn't string out their units into complete squares like we do today, recording everything. So it was the early days. So she, she um, uh, used sort of extemporaneous methods. And these are some of the things that she collected from what is now Joshua Tree National Park and the surrounding area. And I thought you'd like to see these, most of these objects. Uh, Melanie, I think most of these objects are in the collections now at Joshua Tree, but this is her little museum that she had at her home in 29. And eventually she called it uh, the 29 Palms Branch of the Southwest Museum. So these are some of the things that she collected from rock shelters and other sites in the area. And these were in her museum. This is what she hired Edwin Walker to help her keep the museum and to, so folks would come in uh, I don't know how often it was open, but I know you can make an appointment to come and see the museum. These, again, are her photographs. So she collected not only stone artifacts, but also a lot of fiber things. And uh, some of them are quite important because, as you probably know, uh, natural materials don't last very long in the archaeological record. So she was there early on, and she uh, collected some of these materials that are quite rare, including arrow shafts, uh, bow staves, uh, matting, uh, sticks may be used for, um, for rabbit sticks or to get um, uh, animals out of holes and things like that, agave sticks, prize sticks. So um, these, uh, many of these, I think, are in the collections, too. Actually, they thought so much of themselves that they actually had formal portraits done of themselves as archaeologists. And I think this is pretty, pretty funny. But um, she was a very proper person, and she thought this is the way things should be done. So I love these photographs and uh, the fact that they hired a, a photographer to do these. And I particularly love this description. This description was written in a local newspaper, I believe, or maybe it was in a, a local journal of, uh, I can't remember where I found it, but let's read it. This is the conference I was telling you about that the locals plus um, the well-known archeologists attending. So she was making a name for herself. So on the morning of the day, she housed the important folks at her home. By this time, they had built the stone house in 29 that I think many of you are familiar with. That is now the Campbell House. I think it's an, an Airbnb or part of a hotel. And um, um, I'll show you a photograph in a minute. Um, so she took everybody into the field. They went in cars, and it was a big, big do. And then uh, they had lunch in the field. And this was, show, as they say in anthropology now, this was show-off behavior. <laughs> so here are some of the photographs from that conference. And uh, you can see the cars. And this is the only place where I need my pointer. I'll use my finger, works as well. Miss Elizabeth, Betty, right there. You notice she's wearing her fur in the field. I just love this, you know. This is the kind of a person she, she was. Um, 
The Campbells were very philanthropic to the 29 Palms community. Betty was not well liked because of her sort of I guess, even though they contributed a lot to the community, I won't go into that, but um, she sort of had this, you know, noblesse oblige kind of an attitude where she was the person who was allowing the lesser folks to share her interests and her wealth and whatever. Bill, on the other hand, was a regular guy, and he was extremely well liked by folks in the community. But these collections that I just showed you and talked about were really not why she was important. She was first on the scene, so she made large collections. This is true. But I want to talk now about why her brain power made the contribution that it did. Now, they were a couple. They worked together. Bill was a helper. She was the brains. Um, she... Um, was the idea person. And she noticed that when they went to the dry lakes and the extinct rivers, that there were artifacts along their borders. And before this, she had worked mostly with more recent archaeological sites, meaning recent in the last maybe 500 years. But she noticed that along the borders of these ancient lakes that no longer had water in them and rivers that no longer had water in them were artifacts. And what do people need in the desert? Most of all, water, right? So she made the assumption that people were there when the water was there. So... To put it simply, she says, well, if I can find out when the water was there, then I can date what, how old these artifacts are. And she also noticed that they were considerably different than the, what she was finding in the rock shelters and the surface sites uh, in the surroundings of 29 Palms. So this was her problem, and this was why she made her contribution. This was the day before Radio Carmen Day. So there was no way to date things that were on the surface or relatively, un these were surface sites. They were not dug up. They were just on the surface. So there was no way to say how old these were. So she made this thoughtful um, a conclusion that when the water was there, that's when the artifacts were dropped and used in these locations. Now, one of the places where they worked was a, a ancient water body called Lake Mojave. If you drive to Las Vegas and you go through Baker, Baker sits right in the middle of ancient Lake Mojave. So to the north of Baker is Silver Lake Playa. To the south of Baker is Soda Lake Playa. They're very obvious. Lake Mojave was not a particularly deep lake at the end, but it was quite long and quite um, um, extensive. Okay, so it, it had a, I don't, can't remember what, it, what it's, um, um, length is, but you know, it's maybe four or five or six miles long in the old days. So originally, Soda and uh, Silver Lake were connected because as the water rose, it flowed between the two bodies of water. So this was one of the places that she worked, and this place had been studied before. She knew that it was a Pleistocene, meaning an ice age lake. So what, how the lake filled was the Mojave River, which is now dry in most places, originated in the San Bernardino Mountains, flowed across the desert, through Afton Canyon, and 
It still is on the surface in Afton Canyon, but it was a mighty river at one time in the past. And it filled up Lake Mojave, both soda and what we call soda and silver Lake Playas now. It overflowed from Lake Mojave into the Silurian Valley to the Armagosa River and flowed all the way to Lake Manly in Death Valley. So what we see now on the landscape is a lot different than it was during the latter part of the ice ages. I don't know very much about the earlier ice ages, but I know at the time from about 18,000 years ago, which is geologically is not that old, there was a flowing system. And it wasn't just a lake that filled when it rained. It was a flowing water system that allowed fish and waterfowl and shellfish and all the things and all the aquatic plants that go with a flowing lake, not a dead saline lake with fairy shrimp in that we see today when it fills from local rainoff runoff. So folks, this was a great source of resources for people at that time. And the question was, were there people here at that time? Well, these are some of Elizabeth Campbell's photographs from Lake Mojave. And uh, you can see what they were studying. And the lower one is particularly interesting, um, and this is what she based her particular dates on. It's a collage that she made uh, of the overflow channel at the northern end of Lake Mojave. And this is the channel through which, when the water reached a certain level, it overflowed into the Silurian Valley. So as things dried up, at, in the early Holocene, maybe present at the end of the Ice Ages, as things dried up in the desert, the, the level of Lake Mojave dropped considerably until it became an isolated lake. But the last time it was a flowing lake, this channel overflowed into the Silurian Valley. So she figured if she could get the elevation of the last time it was an active lake, she could figure out what the ages of the artifacts were around the edges at, that, at the time of the last complete filling of the lake. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so it's like if you have two, two uh, things of water and you're going like this. So, and it never retained its full stand again. So it was the last time, because there were many earlier stands of Lake Mojave that are much higher, much, um, and you can still see them on the landscape today, and you can see all the beaches as the water dropped. But we're talking about the very last stand. So here are photographs of some of the beach, beaches where she was finding artifacts and the kind of artifacts that she was finding. So there were big points, there were big dome scrapers, there were things that were very different than the more recent artifacts she was finding on the surface um, in the fairly recent archaeological sites. Crescents, too, are very diagnostic of this earlier period of time. And this is a picture of their camp on one of the beaches of Lake Mojave. And this is how they went. They went out in their car, and they took friends with them and colleagues with them. And they had a very nice social time. And they also did a lot of archaeology. So I want to read to you a little passage about what they did when they got there. Okay. So once having located an archaeological camp area, in other words, a site, we ascended the beaches, instruments in hand, and they used barometers, you know, the, uh, the um, 
old mercury barometers for leveling and they didn't have GPS and that kind of stuff that we had today. So they started at the bottom and they walked up the beaches, in other words, from a lower elevation to a higher elevation. And they had, let's see, they had um, uh, I don't know, I think they had several of these. They had three of these instruments and they were carrying around these glass barometers, okay. So, um, as we reached, it says, we, d we ascended the beaches, instruments in hand, invariably as we reached the correct level, mean the level of the outlet channel. Um, uh, flints, she called the artifacts, flints appeared at our feet as if by magic. The camps that recovered higher than this above the old lake margin, oh, nothing was recovered above that and nothing below it. So at the level of the outlet channel and the highest lake stand, this is where she found her artifacts. Here is a clear case of ancient people camping close to a supply uh, of water and food. Nothing other than water level would cause aboriginal man, not people, man, no women there. Yeah. <laughs> aboriginal man to camp on the exact altitude about an area of area approximately 100 square miles, proving that the human occupancy was coincident with the time of the lake's overflow. Does everybody understand that? It's a little bit of a difficult concept to get. Okay. Um, Campbell's argument for the association of the archeological sites with the ancient High Lake was simple and straightforward. And um, the ar uh, archeological sites at Lake Mojave were found at the same elevation virtually wherever the beach line could be identified and these sites contain the same type of an archeological assemblage. Well, this sort of turned things upside down for the archeological community because up until this time, it was thought that um, people in the New World were only about 4,000 years old. And we know if this was an Ice Age lake, that it had to be a minimum, probably, of 10 to 12,000 years old. So what she did was identify the artifacts with the lake shore and the lake had to be 10 or 12 or somewhere around there. So this is her great contribution that she was able to use the landforms and very creative thinking and knowledge, geological knowledge of the Pleistocene lakes to be able to date these artifacts. Well, what do you think happened? <laughs> they published their work in 1937. The Lake Mojave Report, you can still buy it. And uh, one thing that she did was she was smart enough to get a geologist to work with her. And he was a very well-known geologist throughout the scientific world. Um, he was a, a Swedish guy, I think she, he was Swedish, named Ernst Antevs. He was also a paleoclimatologist who would, had worked in Switzerland um, on Lake Varv dating in some of the older sites in the old world. Well, he evidently was employed by the University of Arizona, so she had no problem calling him up and saying, hey, I, will you work with me? And he was very interested. And the Antevs, uh, Ernst and his wife, and Betty and Bill became very, very close friends. There's a whole series of letters between the two. So she not only was smart enough to get um, people to have like a, um, a colleague who knew more about geology and Pleistocene lakes than she did, uh, to work with her. And together they published this little monograph from the Southwest Museum. Guess who paid for the monograph? She did. 
She gave lots of money to the Southwest Museum. Had anybody been to the Southwest Museum when it was still open? I did, yeah. It was a fabulous collection. Um, it's now, you know, everything is at the, at the Autry Center, yes. And nobody can get access to the collections because they're still arranging them. I don't know, Bruce, it's been 10 years at least that they've been arranging them or recording them anyway. Uh, it's a source of frustration to archaeologists. And um, so uh, she gave lots and lots of money. And um, she, she gave money for salaries. They became fellows of the museum. She paid for exhibits. And she was a money bag. So this is part of, but she also did very careful and good work. So one did not negate the other. So there was a big conference that same year in Philadelphia where all the famous archaeologists, including Malcolm Rogers. Does anybody know Malcolm Rogers? Malcolm Rogers was a pioneer, Southern California, Southwest archaeologist, and he was the man. He worked at the Museum of Men in San Diego, and um, he, pub he did lots and lots of work. And he also had looked at Lake Mojave and had not recognized this. So, and he was, he was a you know, mover and shaker, so when she asked to give a paper at the Early Man Conference, they would not allow her to give. They said, well, she could come and look and bring some of her artifacts if she wanted to, but they would not allow her to give a paper. And she was a woman. She was not a professional. She came out of nowhere. So she was turned away, and I think they invited, she said, well, she could bring some artifacts to show, but she said, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to speak, and she did not go to that conference. And uh, she also, uh, as you know, being local people, uh, there was a monograph on the Pinto, Pinto Basin, too. Uh, where we have a river that was an extinct river and we have but that was not quite as old as the Lake Mojave site so she also did that and to show you a little bit about her this is the kind of environment in which she was raised very very wealthy a state with horses and yachts and summer houses formal gardens, and she ended up at the oasis in 29, living in a tent with the burros and the cattle and her husband and um, homesteaded up here. How did this happen? Well, you're going to have to read the book. A series of circumstances. So she was a very interesting character, and um, this was her her their homestead plot and her her um, well and windmill that she talks a lot about in her book. She writes about homesteading. So that's the Campbells. A little bit later, after the conference in their desert mobile and, um, and their house that I'm sure many of you are familiar with here in 29 Palms up at Campbell Hill. So that was about the end of Elizabeth Campbell archeologically when she was turned down until about, no, she went on working. She continued to work she and Bill continued. They worked in Nevada. They worked at almost all the dry lakes in the Mojave Desert. And there's a whole series of uh, field notebooks and uh, places where she worked. So she continued her dry lake work. In fact, once she wrote to uh, Jesse Nussbaum, who was the National Park Service chief archaeologist once, and asked him if she could have a private concession on working at the Dry Lakes, which was really interesting. She didn't want anybody else to work there. 
So she collected, and most of those materials have never been published. And I believe that the collections, I don't know if any are here, but I know there are collections at the Southwest. So there is a whole bunch of materials from the Owens River and Owens Lake and many, many other smaller lake basins in the deserts uh, from the Elizabeth Campbell work. But she sort of disappeared from view. And um, in 1970, Claude Warren, who is my co-author of this book, um, got a job. He became a professor at UNLV. And he started to look at Lake Mojave and dug up some of, dug up, uh, drum, yeah. <laughs> some of Elizabeth Campbell's work. She was, had moved to Arizona and then moved back to 29. Um, but, and she died in 29, um, in 29 Palms, not in 1929, okay. So um, he started to look at Lake Mojave and he became very interested in her work. He had no idea she was still alive. So he never got to meet her. But he started to look at her work and he started to realize how smart she was and how she used landscape and topography to date these sites. And he wrote a little article that was published in the Master Key, which was the archeological um, magazine, I guess, of the Southwest Museum in 1970 called Time and Topography, Elizabeth Campbell's methods of how she dated things. And that's when it started. That's when she started to become recognized for her conception of using the landscape as a dating tool and um, Claude, since that, from that time until he passed away, was just obsessed with this woman. And he went and collected everything he could find. Couldn't figure out how this person with no schooling, no training, but lots of money, um, came up with this. I mean, what was it about her character that made her such a good archeologist? So from that time, he collected materials, and um, he and I got together and wrote this book. And I am disappointed to say that this book, which is a complete biography, Elizabeth Campbell, is not being carried here in the gift shop at Joshua Tree. It's my pet peeve, okay? Of course, they're going to do exhibits on her collections. You know. I don't know when to stop, you know, that. <laughs> but I want you to know that the main collections at Joshua Tree are from Elizabeth Campbell. They're going to have an exhibit in the new project, Phoenix, there. And they're not carrying the biography of this woman. I think perhaps because they don't realize what a revolutionary archaeologist she was. So that was the point of me giving this talk today, is make, you know, creating like a uh, constituency. To say, this was an important, this was an important thing. She has since been proved absolutely correct that these sites around like Mojave at the last high stand were almost 10,000 years old. And this gives us a whole new look. Of course, there's new information. Of course, we know people were here earlier than that now. But at that time, that was really a revolutionary thought. So a shameless advertisement. <laughs> you can um, purchase the book. We tried to make it very readable, you know, for not too scientific. And um, you can purchase the book through Amazon or through the university. It was published by the University of Utah Press. And you know, I don't know if you know it or not, for those who are not academic folks, but when a university press publishes a book, it means it's a good book. So um, it's not self-published. You know, it met all the criteria of peer review and editing and indexing and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I think I'm done. <laughs> And 
And I want to acknowledge um, Melanie Spoo, who played a very big part in gathering the data for, the, for this material and for the book, because she was on it all the time over a, lo a long time, a number of years, and put Claude onto um, pieces of the story that we and he would not have known about. Um, the Historical Society here in town, that was great, sharing their photographs and their data with us. And of course, the Southwest Museum and the Desert Institute, I thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Yes? Uh, in the first part of your presentation, you showed a picture of Bill Campbell holding a large rock, and you referred no, to... No, it's not a rock. Oh. It's an no. Oya. It's an Oya. How do you spell that? O-L-L-A, Spanish, meaning a jar or a vessel. Oh, so it, so it is a jar. You just couldn't see the... the yeah, jar. yeah. It was so big, and it didn't have a neck. So it was, they made those sometimes, too, without neck. So it was just a large storage jar without, you know, the, it had a hole in it. Okay? okay? I, I was thinking yeah, it looks like a melon, doesn't it? it yes. yes. It's just been incredibly strong, but now that I see that it's a jar. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay, yes. I don't think he was incredibly strong. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't Bill Campbell. It was oh, it was not. It was Edwin Walker. Oh, thank yes. You. No, that was not Bill. That was Ed Walker. Yeah. Yes, well, the Pinto Basin, okay, so she came here and she noticed this dry riverbed and down particularly at the end where the, there was, uh, I guess there was a well there and they found um, sites along Pinto Wash down there for the first, I think it's seven miles. There were a number of archeological sites there. So she, those date to we really don't know exactly, but between four and 8,000 years old. And there, there is a dissertation about that, and she also has a monograph about the Pinto Basin too. But that was published after, even though the work I think was done before, the publication that she also paid for um, came after the uh, Lake Mojave report. Yeah, does that answer your question? And if you walk down, well, I've walked down there to those sites, and there's just, there's still materials there all over. Uh, I don't know as much about it as I do about Lake Mojave, because I've worked there and I'm on a number of projects. But yeah, I think that the access is restricted, Melanie? Yes, for that reason. Yes? So go around for was there any indication of population at that time? You know? uh, you're asking a really hard question. It's very hard to make estimations of populations because people were traveling. They weren't necessarily living for a long time in one place, as hunter-gatherers sort of do. Um, you know, they'd, they camp for a while, use up whatever plants were around or hunting whatever animals, and then when things either ran out or plants ripened in a different area. So that means that they probably came back to the same place many times. Usually the seasonal rounds are, you know, people know where the stuff is. So it's, so when you look at the ground, you see an accumulation of many different times when people were there. So to make an estimation from what, like if you found five matadis, would you say there were five women that lived there? Maybe they had husbands and maybe they had kids, but you don't know if those matadis are from one camping event or from many camping event. That's one of the great challenges in desert archeology span because most everything is on the surface. So in other archaeologists, when you have an archaeologies, when you have an accumulation of sediment over time, as you dig down, you have, you know, if the ground is building up like an alluvial fan, um, as you dig down, it gets older and older. It's supposed to be getting older and older. 
and um, you can probably separate events. But on the surface, where everything accumulates in a desert environment, can't do it. Answered? Okay. Did the, was there another question in the back? Yeah. Probably not, but it looks like the car had pretty good clearance. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of stories about them getting stuck, getting stuck in, in flash floods, getting stuck in the sand. But they came equipped to get out of that. I mean, people do it today. Why shouldn't they do it then? I mean, and they were driven by this curiosity, you know. And it was social, and it was interesting, and it was like going on a treasure hunt, so... They did it. And sometimes they had that old station wagon, but they also, there was a truck too, like an open bed truck. Any other questions? Yeah. Did uh, she find anything at the Oasis in 29? Good question. Did Elizabeth Campbell find anything at the Oasis? Yes, she recorded the Oasis as a site. And it's interesting because we were just talking about that yesterday at a meeting. What did she find at the Oasis? Um, I don't know. Uh, I know there's th there are things at the Oasis, um, but she, it was also very, you know, late period. But, you know, it may have been early, but I'll tell you something else um, that nobody asked me. How long were people living at the Oasis? Well, we don't know that quest, the answer to that, but we suspect that they were also living at the Oasis quite early. And the reason is because there was a geology student who was doing her master's thesis on the Pinto Fault that runs through the Oasis. That's why there's an Oasis there, because on a fault zone, water comes up. So. Um, she dug down and had this very deep, I don't know, it must have been about 20 or 30 foot deep um, trench that she studied, you know, to see geologically if she could see the fault in the trench line. And she did, but in the trench line, I could have put a picture in there, there was also uh, one of the layers, or the stratum as we call it, was very dark and it dated, meaning it was a marshy, organic environment there, 9,000 years by radiocarbon dating. So you can maybe make an assumption that if there's water there and a marsh environment 9,000 years ago, that um, people were there at that time. I mean, you can be sure people were there at that time, but we don't have any proof of that. There's been very little archeological work done at the Oasis. So we don't know, but good question. Yeah, back and back. Thank you, Patty, for sharing that information with people. Most people don't know that. So in Palm Springs, there were people, you know, quite early. I have no doubt that people were at the Oasis early too, but no work has been done. So that is to be, to be found out if we want to find out. But, you know, um, as, the, as the environment was drying at the end of the Pleistocene, um, water became a very important commodity, and if there was water, there were people. And, that's, and there were also animals and plants and all the things that people need to sustain themselves, too. Any other? Thank you, Patty. Yeah. Is there anything at all known about the water tribes like the descendants of the people I live on I don't know the answer to that question. The question was, did everybody hear the question? The people, the local people who are among us and living here uh, have been here forever. Uh, genetic 
studies uh, because we don't have any people from like Mojave period and no, as far as I know, no skeletal remains have been recovered. No people themselves have been. Um, so there haven't been any studies. The native people believe that they have, they were created here and this is where they've always been. So I believe their story. I don't see any reason to doubt it. When there's scientific proof to doubt it, then I might doubt it. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more question. That's it. Let you, letting you go. Yeah. We have no remains. So we don't know. All we have left are stone tools. We don't have pottery. We don't have any fiber because that would not last on the surface. The only thing that would, well, pottery would, but we know a lot about pottery ceramics, as we call it, and we know that that was, did not start here till, you know, at the most, maybe a thousand years ago. So all we have left is stone, and that's why um, my motto is, Leave no stone unturned, right? <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. A good audience. Good questions. OK. Uh, my name is Bruce Breidenbecker, and I'm here to talk today about Amboy Crater. If you've ever been down Amboy Road and headed to National Trail Highways, and you turn left instead of right to go to Amboy and cross the tracks, you can, in about a mile, reach the Amboy Crater, which is now a national natural landmark. It's, it's actually in, in the new Mojave Preserve area. And um, so now it's even more protected than it used to be. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, my background is in geology, environmental science. Would you stay by the speaker? So we have, that's the, that's the new sign. Okay, there's an older one. You can drive out there. In fact, I just took that picture Monday. If you look to the right, what you're seeing here on the right is the Google Earth uh, picture of Amboy Crater. And Amboy's put on there, as is the National Trails Highway. I will add that the National Trails Highway is basically closed beyond Amboy to Ludlow presently because the bridges are out. <clears throat> They haven't collapsed yet, but if you go underneath and look, you can see all the timbers are cracked. And so it's closed that way to Ledlow. So you can only go to Amboy Crater. You can't go to some of the others unless you take the railroad right away. And of course, it's closed also the other side of Cadiz in Chambliss area. So you, you do have it closed, but you can still make it out to Amboy Crater. The main thing you notice on this is you can see the wind direction. You know, there's a lot of sand out there. And we'll look at that when we look at, at some of the geologic features. But ultimately, the sand is blowing, and you can see the direction. If you look at this guy right here, where the crater is, you can see that nice black line behind it, or dark line behind it. That's because it doesn't have as much sand in it. And so we're looking at a real sandy volcano there. And it, uh, you can see the field. It's about almost 27 square miles. And there's a lot of features there that you can explore. This is just kind of a location map showing you where it is. You have Amboy Crater there, which we just saw in the picture. You have Bristol Dry Lake, which is where they mine the salt for national chloride and several other groups out there. You have I-40 showing Ludlow and Fenner. It's about 50 miles from here, basically, to one way to get to Amboy Crater. And that's just to kind of show you where it is. Um, if you look at it, though, there's actually, and I wish I had a pointer, but if you look where it says Amboy Crater and you follow National Trail Highway up to Ludlow, there's actually five volcanoes. So this is a chain of volcanoes that is, most of them are pretty young. And uh, you're looking at like Amboy Crater is about 7,900 years when it erupted, according to uh, isotopic dating or radioactive dating as you would know it. 
And uh, you have the main ones you would have heard of is just beyond Amboy, about maybe 10 miles or so, is Dish Hill. If, uh, if you like to go out and collect peridot, peridotite, that's the place to go. There's all kinds of it there that were brought up from the mantle. And then the other one that's the most well-known is Pisgah. But we're going to focus just on Amboy today. <clears throat> Here it is in the distance. You can see Amboy Crater sit, sitting up. You can see I've highlighted in yellow. I don't read this to you. I expect you, you know, to know how to read. You know, and I, there's nothing worse, in my opinion, than someone reading you their PowerPoint. I think they call that, what, death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so at any rate, no death here. We're going to live and enjoy Amboy Crater. I've been going there since 1962 myself. So it, in those days, you could drive right up to the base and hike right in and other things. Uh, but it's about, as I said, 27 square miles approximately, covers 940 feet high, and you see the dark colored rocks, which to a geologist we call that basalt. Everybody else calls it lava rock. Okay, lava rock, basalt. Okay, so if you see the term basalt, that's the lava rock. That's the dark color you see there. And you can see that it's platform lift up and then in front of you, what you see is the, is the playa, which is a dry lake bed. That's a fancy name for dry lake bed. So the dry lake bed there, what happened was during the time when it was much wetter in the last couple million years, basically you had lakes everywhere because you had glaciers up north. And the glaciers up north melted and the water ran down this way into the ancestral Colorado River is essentially what happened. And so you had these lakes that would concentrate the water. They would wash off from the mountains all around them. And all of the things you find in them, the sodium, the chlorine, and everything, is from the rocks in, in the mountains that wash into the lake. And they, of course, get in, in, uh, dissolved in the water. And then as the water dries up, the water goes up as steam, but the salt stays behind. And I'm sure you've all seen that driving by there numerous times, you know. But it's, it's really cool to go out and collect the salt, too. It's, it's a kind of a fun thing to do. And when you get to the volcano, you can find these features. It's what we call a cinder cone. There are actually three major types of volcanoes. There's a shield volcano like you see in Hawaii with Mauna Loa. There's actually the, the composite or strata volcano. That's more like the Cascade Mountains, like a Mount St. Helens or, or uh, Lassen or Shasta or something like that that are very violent, very tall volcanoes. And then you have the cinder cone, which is kind of like a baby volcano. It really, usually for the most part, is no more than 1,000 feet high, 300, 400,000 feet, maybe 2,000 in, in some instances. And they are made up of as you might suspect, cinders. And cinders are hot lava boiling out. You can see up there in the red left, the red scoria. It's red because as it shot through the air, the oxygen basically mixed with it. So it literally rusted. Kind of the same thing that happens to us, you know? We breathe oxygen, we rust. We like to call it aging. You know, call it what you want, but the bottom line is it rusted shooting through the air and it had all these gas bubbles, and then the ones that didn't get as much oxygen stayed a darker color. And so the whole volcano is made of cinders like that, and they're about the size of a quarter or smaller for the most part. And uh, they built up that volcano. You can see to the left one in Mexico that erupted, and you can see what's going on there, how, how that person is watching it. We found out that people say they were watching Amboy Crater erupt, and that's kind of how we're end our talk today. But you have a bomb. That bomb there is actually from Amboy Crater, collected in a day when it was not a natural historical monument, <coughs> I might add, like about 40, 50 years ago. But it's, that's a bomb from there. It's actually about 8 to 10 inches long. They shoot out of the volcano, and they land in various places. And the small cinders kind of make the cone. And, they, and because they're hot, it's kind of like Think of oatmeal, you know, all mushy, all stuck together. So you have all this eruption going on. You have all this mushy scoria all stuck together, making that volcano. Now, the problem with that is, is that usually because you have all these cinders and they're all kind of glued together by the heated, melted edges of them, eventually, as it gets hotter and hotter, it gets weaker and weaker. And there's almost always a place where the volcano basically 
uh, erupts are, are basically the side caves in or washes out. And what you have is, is you have one side of it opened wide where the, uh, <clears throat> where the lava flowed out. And that you see in, um, in, um, in Amboy Crater too. It's, it's, it's really pretty cool. We're going to look at some pictures of that in a little bit, too. This is showing you the inside of the crater. Um, this one here, if you look at it, and I wish, again, I could point, but if you look at the very inside, that's the final last eruption, the last hurrah of this eruption. And so that's kind of where, when we would take groups up there and hike in, that's where we would actually sit and tell our stories. And then you can see the second one. And actually, I'm going to go right there for a minute to point. The third one is actually right there. Anyway, I didn't get high enough. I forgot my ruler. But it's right above. You see where that trail comes out of the second? And you go down about an inch, and you can see a little mound there. That's the third cone right in that area. And then the fourth one is the big one. And then you can see the breach on the side. And that's, of course, how you enter Amboy Crater. And the BLM has actually redone the trail and made it a lot nicer and easier for people because that was always uh, a boulder scramble for a long time. <laughs> but it's a little nicer now. So you have these four cones nestled inside each other. And it's young enough that you can still see the features. You can actually see the cinders in there. You can see the bombs. You can see how it was basically how the lava melted and it stuck together, and then the, the bursting of the, of the lava dam, so to speak, and ultimately going out the side. It went out really, and this is the west side, and around the area because it, it went into the lake bed. And at that time, Bristol Lake had water in it, and it divided it into two lakes. So that's why we know it's younger. Now, this is a, a paper from the USGS that we presented last year, and ultimately it's just showing you ages. The main thing is if you see Amboy, it's kind of in the right, it's, it's, it's in red. It's just right, you see SEMA, and then you go straight down on the right side. <clears throat> right there. That's where Amboy is, and then these are showing dates, and it's showing it less than, um, less than, than 99,000 years old, basically. 9,900 years old, basically, is what you're seeing. And then you're seeing all of the other volcanoes in the area. The bottom line is this makes it one of the youngest volcanoes around. You know, it's uh, very young and has a lot of material in it that is, uh, it has actually studied for the moon rover, it was studied for the Mars rover, and it was, uh, um, has been used for a lot of, a uh, lot of NASA, um, NASA workshops and places like that as they got ready to go to the moon and send the rovers to Mars. So Amboy Crater does have a history that way too. <clears throat> now, the lava flow is what we call a pohoihoi. It's highlighted in yellow there, showing you what it looks like in Hawaii in a perfect world. What it looks like at Amboy in a sandy, um, eroded world. You can still see the, right above where it says Amboy, you can still see the curvature of the A'a, uh -uh, or the Pohoihoi, and you can actually see it in many places. You also have these pressure ridges that are all over, and if, if you walk through there, you can actually, some of these are deep enough that they're above your head. They're like six foot deep and stuff if you go to some of these places. And so I've shown you one in Oregon, and that's by the Three Sisters volcanic area, just a little north of, uh, of Crater Lake. But if you look at them in Amboy, you can see how the pressure is, because what happens is the lava is flowing, and it causes the surface gets hard, it gets a little thicker, and so the lava pushing underneath causes it to break up like that. And what's happening is the lava flowing underneath squirts up, kind of like you know, you're holding your toothpaste tube, and you squeeze it, and it comes out. Well, that's what came out in the squeeze up. That's what the squeeze up is. So the squeeze up, if you look at that, is the center part in the Oregon picture. If you look directly below it at the Amboy, you can kind of see the squeeze up covered in sand. And then you can see a pressure ridge on the left. You have a question? Yes. Go ahead. Um, no, no, no. They are actually flow structures. The ash bombs are.
Which one? Which picture are you talking about? The top one? No, it's, it's, you're talking about the now, no, the crack is like this. What's happening is the whole thing is flowing like this. As it's flowing around the edges, you have lava pushing on it. And as it pushes on it, it pushes it up. And then it, there's a crack made from the pushing up. And then the lava oozes up through the crack. That lava that oozes up through the crack is the squeeze up. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Okay. So that's what we're looking at there. But again, remember, this is Sandy. Remember that first picture? Yeah. You know, that's, that's one reason why they actually used it for the Mars rover is because of all the sand in the area. <clears throat> and this is showing you what we call vesicles. If you look at the top picture, you have there, you see those holes in the rocks? Those are gas bubbles. When this lava was flowing, it's kind of like if you take a soda pop bottle and you shake it up really, really, really well, and then you open it, of course not looking at it, <laughs> so that you get squirted, but you, all, the, all, the, all the bubbles and foam comes up from the carbon dioxide. That's what's happening to the top part of this lava flow. All the gas is escaping and it's going to the top, and the lava is cooling, and the gas was there when it cooled, so it left, left a hole of where it used to be once it, uh, once it evaporated away. So you have your vesicles. The cool part is if you look at those, you can see instead of round that they become oval shaped like that. And from that you can tell their, which direction they're flowing in. You can get relative direction of flow by looking at the vesicles. Um, you also see some columnar joints. They aren't near as spectacular as Devil's Pulse Pile, which I have on the right. But you have, yourself, uh, you have yourself a number of them there. And uh, you have to remember, you're looking at flows that are maybe eight feet thick at best, not like 100 feet thick, <laughs> like you see up at Devil's Post Pile. <clears throat> and these are just some other flow features I'm, I'm going to show you. You can see Amboy Crater. You can see the Breach Crater right there on this side looking at it. You can see all of the pressure ridges. In this, in this picture here taken from a, from a flight. If you look at it on the ground, you can actually see, if you notice, you can see the curvature of that picture on the right. That's from, it was columnar joints and it was flowing and you can see in the middle where the flow was the strongest or moving the most, right there in the middle part of that compared to the sides. So you can get that, almost like if you pour water on a table and it just kind of moves out kind of thing. So. That's what you're seeing. <clears throat> and this one, I better go back. The bottom left is just showing you what it's like hiking out, looking at where you had the breaching of the volcano and also where the lava flow went. All the lava went out this direction, basically. <clears throat> now, going to leave the geology a little bit and we're going to talk a little bit about ecology and um, in order to talk about ecology, we need to understand that plants, animals, and humans lived in this area and have lived in this area for really quite a period of time. But before we actually talk about them, we're going to look a little bit at what we call an ecosystem. Ecosystem, I have it right there in yellow highlighted for you. And what an ecosystem is, is it includes all the living and non-living parts of, of a group of animals and plants and where they, where they live. So basically when you're looking at the ecosystem, you're looking at the living and non-living. So what kind of soil is there? What are the rocks? What is the air like? What is the climate like? And then what animals live there? And a lot of animals live there. Uh, most of them are traveling through. You know, ecosystems are usually based upon the plant assemblages because they have their roots down and they can't run out when it gets hot or hotter are drier or whatever the case, but the animals can. You see coyotes everywhere. In fact, one of the last times I was out there, I actually saw a badger out there. I've never seen a badger out there, but I, I couldn't believe it. I was looking at it, and it was right there where you first drive in. It was pretty cool to see that. So things are changing there, too. <clears throat> and what I have here to, to focus on the human part is the old Amboy train station from 1968. You can see it up there on the top right. It's been torn down now, but uh, the, the person who was uh, the telegraph and the station master basically lived in the back part of that house. 
And then, just kind of for giggles, a 1925 picture from the air of Amboy. Actually, it looks bigger then. Now remember, train tracks. If you go up to where the town is and you see that little blur to the right, which is an air, 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 airport, basically, or for airport landing, you see that National Trails Highway is dirt. So it was dirt for a long time. <laughs> you know, you can see the dirt road heading out on north of the tracks. It actually now goes south of the tracks and it's been changed a little bit, but that, that's what you see in that picture. So put a little bit of the human part in there. <clears throat> but when we look at the plant assemblages, the two that are most dominant in, uh, in Amboy are the creosote bush scrub, and I have a picture of a creosote bush there by Squeeze Up and uh, Pressure Ridge, and you have yourself, everybody who's living in the desert knows a creosote bush, what, kind of what they look like. It's one of the dominant plants, and for those of us who love the desert, there's nothing like creosote bush after a rainstorm. And I, you know, really pleasant older, you know, really pretty good. So there's a creosote bush, and there's several types. We won't get into that in this talk. And then the desert holly. And there were others, you know, if you notice, I have them there. But the two I saw that were most common in the area were, of course, the creosote bush and the desert holly, which is in the volcano itself. And both of these were used by the native populations for, for food and medicine and a lot of other, other things. Like, uh, for a lot of the native people, the uh, creosote bush was kind of like the medicine cabinet in a lot of ways. Plus, you know, they made all kinds of, uh, all kinds of things out of it, clothing and shoes and things continue. They made those out of yuccas too, though. And if you get really lucky and you have a wet year, you get to see the wildflowers. And the ones I've seen the most are, of course, the desert sunflower. You can see Colding Amboy Crater there. And the desert verbena. Those are two of the more common ones you find out there. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. We only, we don't want to talk all day. So there is a lot of plants out there. It's amazing when you get into these ecosystem what lives in the desert. There are plants that live in the desert that only bloom every 50 years. And their seeds stay dormant until it's just right. And some of them even longer than that, and some are shorter. But it's interesting to, to think about that, because that's why you see so many different ones. Um, and they don't always, the same ones don't always come out. And lately, or the last maybe three or four years, I've seen the desert lilies out there. And I've never I haven't seen one since the last five or six years. I've never seen them out there. This is what they look like. I want to add there that they are protected. They're a protected plant. All, all wild lilies are protected, and they should not be picked up or dug up. So they, they are a protected species. So just be careful of that, you know. Take pictures, look at them, leave your footprints, but leave the plant there. It's a beautiful plant. You know. One of my favorites when I go out there anymore. Now, we're going to look a little bit about humans. Back about 30 years ago, I made this table uh, for the Desert Institute, I think it was, uh, showing kind of like what happened with people. And it kind of puts everything in one picture. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I have the essence of it. But basically, it started out, this area was very wet. You had lakes. You can tell by the dry lake beds. And uh, ultimately, it dried up. And the native people, you know, they were along the edge of these lakes, and they were having a good life. But it dried up, and it continued to dry up. And as it continued to dry up, from the best number I could find when I was doing research was, it seems about the last 10,000 years or so, people have been in the area. And um, these people started first with the Native Americans. And the tribes I have listed there is Serrano, Chemiwavi, Shoshone, Paiute, and Mojave. Now, the Paiute has been kind of broken into other groups now, too. So they, you have to remember, I did this in 1997. So it's been a couple of days. Uh, and then you look at the early humans. They hunted. They actually hunted bison. And if you get, into, uh, you get into the Bristol Mountains north of there, you can actually find mastodon tracks and, and skeletal remains and things if, if you look in those areas. And 
which we have found and seen before as part of our, our research. Um, if you look at who came in, basically Native Americans first, as our previous speaker said, they look at themselves as always having been here. And so you have them, then the Spanish explorers, and the first one you hear about is the father, Francis Garcias. And he's the one that got the Mojave people to bring him across what would eventually become the Mojave Trail or the Mojave Road and brought him across. So he was, he's the first Anglo person who crossed the Mojave that historically that, that, that we seem to be able to find out about. And then you have Jedediah Smith, Kit Carson, and John Fremont. They all, they all came through this area too using this Mojave Road. Um, what else happened? Well, we had miners, lots of mines. If you, you know, all you have to do is go into these mountains and you can find all kinds of mines and collect all kinds of minerals and things. And um, you have ranchers, not so much ranching anymore. It's, it's, uh, because it's not as wet, you don't have as much growth and you can't really graze cattle in the desert very well anymore. <clears throat> Although there are places where they do it. And you had homesteaders, railroads were a big one. The railroads actually opened it up to the, the, the first person, the first groups of people that actually started to live there. And what they did is they had these stations because they had steam engines, and as you know, they needed water. So they would save the water towers, and each of these towns had a water tower. And they named them, actually, most of them were alphabetical, although some of them were out of that. And then you had the military. A large amount of the Mojave Desert is basically military reservations. It's a, it's a bunch of them. You have, uh, besides 29 Palms, you have Fort Irwin, you have China Lake, and no, there's a whole bunch of others too. And then ultimately recreational areas where they went. <clears throat> now, now comes the fun part. This is the part I really like. Okay, there you can see the four the four nestled cones on the top picture on the right. You can see us sitting in the, in the middle one, the last one. And ultimately, we would talk about Amboy Crater, and we would tell about human stories. And as you can see to the left, there's burning tires. Yeah, the burning tires that were put in Amboy Crater. Uh, apparently, it happened more than once, but we'll talk about that in the next few slides. And then you have the Native American story on how it formed. Um, and you have your, your dancer who would dance and sink into the ground, and then the fox, which we tell the story as our kind of final hurrah, so to speak. So with that, <clears throat> as I said, there are many stories about someone lugging tires and burnable equipment and things into Amboy Crater and light it on fire. And then everybody thinking, oh no, it's erupting. Well, in the first place, it's an extinct volcano. It's not going to erupt. It, the, the magma from it occurred when offshore you had subduction occurring and the melting of all of the magma down there working its way up. Well, about 24 million years ago, approximately, it went to a strike slip San Andreas fault type movement and no longer subduction melting rock moving to the surface making volcanoes. But the stuff that was already heated up, the lava, was already headed up. So it took it a while to get there, but it eventually did. So the lava was basically used up and from what we can tell from what went up. So it's not going to really erupt again, but a lot of people had fun with that through the years. And if you look at it, I, I have here the August 1963. Maggie McShane is the name of the lady. And she wrote from the Needles, California Desert Star. And it was in 1963 that this was the first article I could really find on it of, of any type. And there, there's a lot of them. But <clears throat> basically what it boils down to is you had, you had young people living in Amboy. You had the school, and the school was a K through 12, and boys school now, you drive by, it's all shut down, falling apart. But it used to have you know, quite a few students in it, at least 20, 30. I guess in those days, that was a lot. So you, you had students there. And as you know from living in the desert, um, when you're young, you get bored. And 
you wonder, what am I going to do? You know, there's not much to do. Well, yeah, there is. There's a whole desert out there to explore. That's what I got to do, you know, explore. And I grew up in Sky Valley in the 1950s, and uh, we were all there was out there. And so, yes, we entertain ourselves. So I can relate to that of there's, what do I do? Well, I go out and learn the desert. I learn about the rocks. And so I became a geologist. <laughs> Because why? We had a rock garden. Most people in the desert do, if you think about it. So what you had is these kids, kind of extra time on their hand, not sure what to do. So they thought it would be really fun to collect a bunch of tires and other burnable materials. And without telling any, their parents or anybody else, they would fill the volcano with these tires and this burnable material. And um, ultimately, when the time was right, they, they lit it on fire. And they thought everybody would really enjoy it. And it was a really great joke. Um, that's not the way the town took it. I mean, they were really upset. Uh, the, the, there were a number of native people who, uh, who worked, at, uh, <clears throat> worked at Roy's and worked for the railroad. And they were really upset that, that their sacred area had been... Uh, had been violated is the way they felt about it. But at any rate, they really didn't tell their parents right away what they did, but eventually they did, uh, because what happened was the telegraph operator saw it, they called the railroad and told them, Amboy Crater is erupting, what are we gonna do? You know, so they actually got, the Los Angeles time got a air, hired an airplane to come out, fly over it, and immediately they could tell that it, the smoke wasn't getting thicker, you didn't have lava coming out, and they could see the fire burning. So it was pretty easy to tell right away it was a hoax. And um, eventually the kids admitted that they did it. Yes? So that happened about like the 1920s? Actually, yeah, because they're, when they're getting ready to leave town, Model Ts, yeah. I haven't seen one of those except, you know, driving down in those car shows <laughs> lately. I mean, really. but. They loaded up their Model Ts, were moving out. The, the telegraph operator contacted the railroad, said, send a train out here and get us out of here. <laughs> and then eventually, after not hearing anything for an hour, said, just send an engine and get me out of here, <laughs> was what he said. So here they are trying to get out of there. And um, ultimately, the kids admitted what they did. They were chastised. It doesn't really say that any of them were charged. Uh, nowadays, if you did that, you'd probably be a felon. You'd spend some time in jail. <coughs> you would, uh, instead of it just being a nice joke, that shame on you for getting carried away. But you have to remember, things were different in the early 1900s. Now, they weren't the only ones, though. It's happened over and over if, if you look at it. The earliest one is right here from Deborah Wall Outdoors from the October 2017 Boulder Review. And in it, in the early 1900s, a group of the railroad workers from Baghdad, which was a town to the west, they actually put a bunch of brush and stuff in there. And when the passenger trains come by with all the passengers, they lit it on fire so they could see an erupting volcano as part of their tour. So I'm sure that's where these kids probably got their idea of, oh, yeah, it's been done before. No big deal. So that's the only one that's really different. Is, is the one with the workers. And there's several railroad worker ones, too, besides this one, several others. There's about, if you look at it, there's at least five to seven times. But the biggest thing I found is that nobody admits they did it except this one guy, Steve, who we're going to hear from. And, um, <clears throat> and, boy, you can't blame him, really, if you think about it. But at any rate, that's, that's what goes on there. So what you have is in Bob Moore, he did it in the minor, and he tells a story of about, he puts it in 1935, which is probably that same event that was t talked about in the, uh, in the previous talk. And so you have what you have there is um, young guys with bald tires caught in Barstow. A truckload of bald tires were caught in Barstow, and they were the perpetrators. So a pickup truck, Model T's that doesn't quite fit, you know, there's something not quite right with that one. But it, it fits in with some of the other stories, so it's kind of intriguing. Because if you look here, you have this blogger, his name is Dan McShane, he's a geologist from Bellingham. 
And in, 19, in 2011, in his blog, he wrote the story again. And in it, he talks about it happening in 1970. And this gentleman by the name of Steve, who gave no last name, uh, ultimately said, no, that's not really exactly what happened. Here it is, and I have his blog quoted there, that tires were, were used, and they were only gathered in a couple of days, and they, were fr they used an old truck that was from the Texaco station, which is now the Roy's area. And so they would use that because they would haul stuff to the dump, the local dump, and, and they, they did it that way. They also put timers on when it would ignite so they could be somewhere else when, they <laughs> when, it, when it went off, <laughs> which is pretty cool if you think about it. They thought, I'm going to have an alibi. Well, they were in Barstow with bald tires in the back of the truck. <laughs> yeah, they were caught, needless to say. And uh, he's, he's saying that really... And this is where, you, where I put in yellow there that the main people who were really troubled by it were, of course, the natives who that area is sacred to them, as we're going to learn when we talk about our next story. So. I thought having a nice picture of burning tires would be pretty cool. <clears throat> Can you imagine that, you know, driving by and, oh, no, it's erupting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well... Who knows? <laughs> I think they were more worried about that. So we have, he who can do, go down under the earth, and it's a mat ka pe toya, which means he who can go down under the earth. And this is the hunter. And the cool part about this one, and I really love this story, is that the Native Americans saw this happen in order to have this story. And you have yourself a hunter, and as like most of these stories start out, what you have is times were different. You know, animals and people could talk, they were a little more friendly. Times were different, things were different than they are now. And of course, because of that, you know, we had people who hunted. Now, we, we know that even though the animals could talk to the people, they still hunted them and, uh, uh, and still, still did use them for uh, nourishment. But we also know that uh, that hunting was a key part of of their uh, of their culture and their living. And this hunter was special because what he would do is he would go into an area, and he would gather all the all the trees and all the shrubs and everything he could, and he'd start a big fire, and this fire would begin to burn really really hot, and then he would sing this song that basically says, "As I sing my name, I will sink into the ground." And he's dancing around in a circle, sinking into the ground as he dances around. And then he gets all the way covered up in the ground. And the fire burns and basically cooks all the food. So when he dances out, he comes out and all the food is laying there all cooked and everything. And he takes it back to his village. And they love him because they don't have to cook it, <laughs> among other things. So he's, he, he brings their food. So he's very loved by his people. Well, one day when he was doing this, um, he came up dancing out of the ground and there was a fox sitting there and the best I could find was that kit fox that was in our office that, that's there but this fox was sitting there and the fox was looking at the dead animals and they were all cooked and, 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 and the hunter said the fire hunter said go ahead take all you want there's plenty of food here don't worry about it and I uh, Fox kind of looked around, smelled, and said, no, it kind of stinks. I don't like it. I'm going to leave and go elsewhere. So the fox did head off, but it followed our fire hunter. And as it did, it memorized the words to the song that would sink into the ground. So it would sink into the ground also, because it figured this would be a great way to hunt. So that's what the fox did. It went over to where Amboy Crater is. It gathered all the brush and everything, lit it on fire, and the fire began to burn, and it began to burn really, really hot. And it got hotter and hotter and hotter. And as it, and as it got hotter and hotter, the fox was thinking, I better get in the ground. So he began to sing the song and dance into the ground. The problem was he didn't sink. So he started to get really worried. So he started dancing a little faster, singing a little louder. Didn't do any good. Basically stayed up there and burned in the fire. I guess he became food. What happened? I don't know. But basically he burned in the fire, 
But the fire continued to burn so much so because dancing out is what stopped the fire. The fox couldn't even dance in or out to stop the fire. So the fire burned, it melted all the rocks, it began to basically get all carried away and you began to have a volcano form and the melted rocks flowing all the way into Barstow and other places. And so the fire hunter heard about this and he said, I need to go find out what's going on. So he gets there and he sees it, he figures out what happened and he dances and puts the fire out. Now, he was really embarrassed that this happened because that was his trademark. That was the way he hunted, and he was ashamed. And so, as often happens in days like that, his shame led him to train himself to change himself into a little worm, which we call an ant lion. Right there at the top. So he changed himself into a worm that crawls around. You can see the tracks in the middle. And you can see the hole, and guess what? Goes down feet first, just like when he danced. And so the story ends with the saying that if you think you caught him, that's not true, because he's already in the ground laughing at you. So, but that's our Amboy Crater story. There's a lot more detail. Now, here's Amboy in a more pleasant time. Water. I actually swam in that when it was, it was a long time ago. <laughs> But uh, you can see Amboy Crater in the background. This is almost like where that first picture was, where you could see the, the, the evaporite deposits, the salt. And uh, you can see Amboy Crater in the background. So anything anybody wants to ask? Any questions, any comments, thoughts? Yes? Would the uh, lake then have had water in it when the volcano erupted? The yes, it did. Yeah, if you look at, uh, I don't have the picture, but if you go to Google Earth and you look, you can see the flow and you can see Bristol Lake on the left side and on the right you can see, what do they call that one, Lavik Lake. So it split the lake in half, it actually did, and you can see the two lakes when you're standing on the south rim looking out at the base. Oh no 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 no! The pohoihoi is is from the lava, and it's from the uh, it's because it's very viscous or thick because of the steam and the gases in in the lava. So you don't think there was water around when the um, volcano? Well, the lake was there. Yeah, it erupted when the lake was there. But the pohoihoi was not shaped by the water. No, the pohoihoi was shaped by the by the composition and and the gases and liquid in the lava. No, pumice is, is different. It's silica. It's not a... <laughs> pumice is more like with a rhyolite. It's with a different kind of flow. Although you can find little bits, but usually when you find the dark colored, the basalt lava, usually you just find the scoria and, and the like because its, it's composition is, is mostly... Uh, it's going to be plagioclase, feldspar, hornblende, and... Uh, well, not hornblende. Yeah, hornblende and augite, which is uh, those three minerals, which are two dark minerals and a lighter mineral. Any iron? So, well, the yeah, yeah, the the uh, hornblende and the uh, augite are what we call ferromags. They're iron, magnesium, silicates is what they are. So that accounts for the possible kind of reddish color. The reddish color is because being ejected in the air and mixing with the oxygen. And, you, and you, can f you can go to some of the block areas just to the west of the crater. There's a big area where it's all red, and you can find the pieces of the red. As usually, they've shot through the air and been oxygenated. Yeah, I thought Scoria was just reddish because of um, possible oxygen. Or well, it is iron. I, I mean, they're mostly iron and magnesium. That's the m most common minerals in them, along with the silicates. You have aluminum and some other things. No, no. Obsidian is, is more of a uh, is more of what we call a felsic rock. It's more in a rhyolite, which is a lighter, pinker-colored eruption. You, you, uh, the really closest, really heavy uh, obsidian is obsidian dome at Salton Sea, or you have to go up Highway 395 into the Mammoth area, 
Mono Lake area. There's a lot there at Obsidian Domes there. But, uh, so, but, so anyway, that was my specialty was rocks and minerals. <laughs> People would bring them to me for years and identify them. Oh. Yeah, any other questions? Yes? And you said that the, the source for this lava was subduction along the coast of California? Mm -hmm. Um, it, the subduction stopped when the San Andreas Fault started. Basically what happens is, if this is Baja, California, you had basically the, 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 East, or the Pacific Rise comes up, which is part of your, your, trent, your trent system, and basically it began to, it not only does because of the curvature of the Earth, it splits apart and slides. So it, what you would call oblique movement, so it splits apart, moves up. Well, as you go from the tip of Baja, California, up to the Salton Sea area where Bombay Beach is, where the San Andreas starts, proper starts, uh, basically you're looking at going from ripping apart, sliding, to more just sliding. So about 24 million years ago, you had, you had several plates down south that all came together and forced the west coast up. So what's happening is that whole area there is sliding past us at an average rate of about an inch a year. And so that was prior to the San Andreas Fault taking place. But the magma was already coming up. So the subduction must have occurred uh, earlier in time. A couple hundred so million years ago. Well, a couple million years ago. And then a couple it hundred million. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then it took time for the magma to come up. And yeah. come well, well, what basically happened is you had the North American continent and you had, because of subduction, you had these change of islands, these volcanic island chains like Japan, Philippines, those are all examples of that. And they were crashing against the shoreline of the west coast of, of, uh, of California and further north, but mostly California. So they were crashing against there, these chains of islands. And so these chains of islands were erupting volcanoes, but down below them were these huge magma chambers. And uh, those huge magma chambers still kept lava in them, and through the change, they were forced up. They were starting up, and then as you started going to the strike slip, they were still coming up. You know, because if I had a geologic map, I could show you more, but sorry. <laughs> yes? I had a question? No? Any other questions? Thoughts? Comments? Are there any other volcanoes out in our desert area, or, or would it be too far from the coast? No, there's, you, you have that whole seam of volcanic field, which is in the Mojave Preserve, which is, and then you have basically the whole Amboy, the whole Amboy axis. You have them in Pioneer Town. You can see, uh, there's some there. You go up uh, Old Woman Springs Road, you can go to Ruby Mountain. Malapai is kind of a push-up of one, you know, which is in the park. So there, there's a number of them around, you know, just not as many as you find once you get north of, uh, when the San Andreas Fault goes offshore at about Mendocino, that's where you start to pick up the Cascade Mountains because subduction is predominant north of there. And so that's what makes the, the whole Cascade Range and those composite volcanoes. So hopefully that answers at least a little bit of what you were wanting. I could talk about that probably forever, but <laughs> I don't think you want that. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, thoughts? This is pretty cool stuff. You get a chance, you should go out there, but not during the summer. I, I was actually out there with a group. We would usually go about November, December, and again, January, February. I took field trips out there for like 40 years. And um, many times we were Search and Rescue was out there looking for people that, <clears throat> that had died. And in fact, the Desert Symposium, which we met here last year, we had to get special insurance to go to Amboy Crater uh, uh, in order to cover our group that went there just because of all the deaths and things that have happened there. So, When is the best time to hike up? Um, about November through about February or March. It, it depends on the year. You want it to cool off. You, you, you don't want it to be over 80 there. The good thing about 80, that's kind of like 
almost the rattlesnake mark, you know. <laughs> at, 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 you know, above 80, they, they don't mind being out. Below 80, they're a little slower, which you can maybe run better. <laughs> or at least back up. You don't want to run from them. You want to back up, you know, so. But, yeah, November, <laughs> November, late November into December, January, February is really a great time. I mean, I was just out there the other day, but I, I wouldn't even hike it then, you know, because especially by myself. Don't go by yourself and take plenty of water. Any other comments? No? Well, thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back, everyone. Um, or welcome for the first time, maybe. Um, this is gonna be our last lecture of the day, and we're gonna welcome um, Haley Alskin, and she's gonna be talking about what's in a circle, exploring the rock circles in Anza Borrego Desert State Park. Okay. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about rock circles. I don't know um, if you guys are gonna leave here uh, more educated or more confused by what I'm talking about, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so first off, I just wanted to talk about, um, so Anza Brego Desert State Park is located in the Colorado Desert of Southern California. It's a sub-region of the Sonoran Desert, and it's, yeah, it's not in Colorado. It's called that because of the Colorado River. Um, so the park itself stretches all the way into Riverside County and then almost down to the Mexican border in the south. Um, it's over 600,000 acres and it's about six times the size of any other state park in California. Um, so, do you mind just clicking it when yeah. I tell you? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the park's on the traditional homelands of the Kumeyaay, the Kawea, um, and it's the edges of the Copeno. Um, it's also kind of the eastern area of the park is in the traditional use area of the Cocopa, who'd come into eastern Anza Borrego for trade and resources. Um, and then you can see the park, it's kind of divided mostly the Kawea um, territory up in the north, and then the Kumeyaay are in the south part of the park, and then the Copeno just kind of a little bit into the Coyote Canyon area, and they were really closely um, connected with the Kawea and um, a lot of trade and intermarriage there, so coming down into Coyote Canyon um, up there. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about a couple different kinds of circles. Um, so I kind of wanted to give you guys a variety of like the different types, but then I'm mainly going to be focusing on one type, um, which we kind of generically call rock circles, even though these are all kind of rock circles. Um, so the first type is we have these rock houses, um, and they're up in the northern part of Anza Borrego, uh, mainly in Kauia territory, and we have really good evidence of how these were used because they were used well into the 1900s. Um, and they have really high stacked walls. Um, you can see in this photo really developed walls, probably stacked like 16 rocks high. Um, and then we, this is kind of a very developed one. I say a lot of the ones I see are like four or five rocks tall, or they might have crumbled, but you can still see that they were stacked higher because the rocks have like fallen around on the edges. Um, so these are the rock houses and they were used as they're called. They were used as houses, they're living structures. Um, people spent a lot of time in these. They would have used vegetation to over the top to cover um, the roof. And there's usually a lot of artifacts found around them because people were, they were living there. They were spending a lot of time there. Um, so the next type I wanted to talk about were, we don't really call, again, we don't call these rock circles, but they present in a similar way, and those are agave roasting pits. So we have agave all over Anza Borrego Desert State Park, and pretty much wherever we have agave, we have agave roasting pits. Um, it's one of the main uh, food sources for both the Kuiya and the Kumeyaay. Um, 
they would harvest it in the spring. So the agave plant itself, it's building up all of the sugar in um, the base, the root area. And then when it's ready to bloom, it's stored as much sugar basically as it can and it's gonna shoot that, you know, it's gonna use that energy to put up all the flowers and everything. So um, they would harvest it right when that stalk is just above the leaves and that's when the root itself is the sweetest. Um, so in these roasting pits, how they um, appear is kind of slight depressions normally in the center and then usually ashy soil and fire affected rock. Um, fire affected rock can be discolored, it can be cracked in certain ways, so that's how we identify that. Um, they often appear in like softer soil and I think to a certain extent that's because when you're building an agave roasting pit, you're digging pretty deep. <laughs> So they're not digging in the rocky areas, they're digging where it's easier. Um, so the roasting pits themselves are earthen ovens. Um, so they're digging down, they're lining um, it with rocks, heating those rocks up, putting um, the agave root into it, covering it with a couple more hot rocks and then covering the whole, um, the whole oven with dirt for usually like two days or so to really let that root um, roast in the oven. Um, so what, the, what we're seeing, what we're seeing with that depression, a scattering of rocks kind of in circular around it, is we're seeing the excavation of that, right? So it's slightly depressed because they might have filled it back in, but with compaction, the sand compacts more, you know, there's less sand compacting, so there's not as much th there in volume. And then as they're digging it out, they're kind of throwing the rocks to the side of their pit, and it's creating a circle. So these appear kind of in the same, you know, they're, like I said, they're slightly different. They're, they're than the rock, other rock circles I'm going to talk about, but they, you know, you could still describe this as a rock circle if you just look at it. But so we call these agave roasting pits, and like I said, they have ashy, fire affected, slight depressions. All right. So the main event is. Um, these, we call them rock circles or cleared circles. Sometimes they're often they're rec referred to as sleeping circles. Um, I would say we're moving more away from that term because that makes it sound like we know what's happening. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're sleeping in them, sleeping circles. And we, we don't know that. Um, so one of the first uh, archeologists who recorded these, he called them sleeping circles in like the early 1930s. And, um, but as time has moved on, we, we use just more generic, just rock circles, because we don't know. Um, so again, I'm gonna be talking about these, and we, uh, we don't know how old they are, we don't know what they were used for, so hopefully I can give you guys some information to think about what, what could these possibly be. All right, so here's um, an aerial photo taken along a ridge in Anza Borrego by one of the volunteers in our archeology span program. And hopefully you guys can see that there are circles on this. So if you can see the telephone pole on uh, the right side, there's one almost directly from the shadow of it. Hopefully you guys are seeing that. Then there's another one a little bit to the left. Oh, there's like actually a couple to the left of that, kind of in a straight line. And then a couple more as you go across. So they're, they're pretty visible from the air. It's one of the easiest ways to see them actually. Sometimes on the ground, they can be really subtle. And then you look from above and it's like, oh yeah, that's a circular cleared area. Um, so we see these mainly in the southern part of Anza Borrego, but we get them a little bit on the eastern, northeastern side. Um, and they appear in heavy concentrations normally, but sometimes we only see, we'll have some areas with like one or two, but then there's one area that's nine square miles that has over 500 of these circles. Um, they're usually kind of on elevated ridges that are rockier soil. So that's kind of going into what I was talking about, agave roasting pits we see in softer soils normally, but these are in pretty rocky areas, usually with desert, desert pavements or at least a lot of like cobbles. Um, 
they're usually on the rocky ridges, which means they have great vistas. Um, I mean, when you're up on these, you can see really far. They're beautiful places to be. Um, yeah, and that also keeps them out of the washes. So maybe possibly they don't want in the wash because, you know, things in washes tend to wash away. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit about kind of where we find these circles in Anza Borrego. Um, like I was saying, so we have that really concentrated area with over, so in over the like nine miles, we have like 500 of these. Um, and then kind of with that, sometimes we see them just like one by itself, like the one down there. But then you can see up here, there's a group of probably like six of them really tight together. They're touching each other. Um, yeah, these are, they're only, you can see in this photo, they're only stacked about one rock high, maybe a couple smaller rocks stacked in between, but they're not very tall, not like the rock houses. Um, in size, they're about one and a half to three, three meters. And then I'd say like three meters is kind of unusual. That's really big. So most of the ones we find are around 2.5 to two meters. So they're not huge. Um, you could kind of lay down in them and probably be comfortable, but they're not real big. And it, even for one person laying down, it'd be a little bit tight. Um, definitely not having putting a lot of people in this size. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to kind of like, why are these so mysterious? Like, why can't we figure out what's happening here? Um, so one of the reasons is there's just not very many artifacts around these. We find these features <coughs> and there's you know, there's not um, evidence of heavy habitation. There's not lots of um, stone tools for everyday use. There's not lots of pottery because that you know they were living there for a long time and pots break, so you get you get potsherds around. There's not um, like black dark soils that come from living in an area for a long time. So there there aren't any of these kind of helpful diagnostic artifacts, um, especially pottery um, is a really dateable artifact. Um, if you find pottery, you know it's probably from the last thousand years. So, you know, that helps a, a little bit, let's say. So, okay, maybe it's not from the last thousand years, but that still leaves a lot of years to try and figure out when these were used. Um, and also, it's not only lack of pottery, it's lack of we don't find a lot of stone tools either. So it's like, okay, maybe this is just an area that they're not bringing goods to, you know? They're just not bringing tools to this area because they're using it for ritual or meditation or it's art or whatever it is, you know? So maybe it is recent, but they just didn't bring pottery there. Um, so we can't date it with artifacts. Um, there have been attempts to date it using um, OSL, optically stimulated luminescence, which is, this is very simplified. <laughs> it's basically dating when a quartz crystal was last exposed to solar radiation. So if we can date when a quartz crystal was, was exposed to solar radiation, we can, um, we can date when it was buried. So if someone's making a rock circle, the idea was I can date when they put this rock on top of these quartz crystals, because now they're not exposed to the solar radiation anymore. Um, the problem with that is kind of a couple of things. So one is solar radiation, like it tends to go a little bit further. It penetrates a little bit deeper than just the, stop, the surface. So you want to go a little bit deeper than a couple centimeters if you're using this method. Um, and the other one is if you're not really, really careful in collecting it in complete darkness before you date the radiation, then you've wiped the slate again. It was exposed <laughs> today to solar radiation and it's, it's not gonna be useful. So dating these has been really difficult. Um, people tend to think, we tend to think they're really old, like I said, mostly because we don't see pottery, um, but I, we really don't know. <laughs> uh, all right, 
so, and then this is kind of the other version. I mentioned we have the rock circles and then we have the cleared circles. Um, so here you can see they're not necessarily rock lined, but there are cleared areas where they've moved the bigger rocks kind of out of the way, which I think when you think about it, it's like, okay, that leaves a nicer area to sit, to lay down in. Um, but one of the problems with these is when we've looked into it, it's something like this could happen naturally. Um, if you imagine kind of a creosote bush growing up, and then we have really high winds in the right in the desert, right? So it's blowing, the branches are blowing, and they're sweeping, <clears throat> and they're sweeping, and the pebbles are kind of going around. So there's some thought that these cleared circles could possibly be um, because there was a creosote there once upon a time. The creosotes died and left this, this cleared circle because it moved the pebbles to the edges. Um, you know, the rock circles that are really rock line very definitively those are man-made, but these cleared circles, you know, th there's definitely ways that they, it, it could be that they're from natural processes. All right, so I've kind of touched on this. So wh what, are th what are they used for? So um, like I said, one of the theories was that they're, they're sleeping circles. People are, you know, they're traveling across the desert, they need a place to sleep, so they're clearing the rocks out of the way and just lay, laying down in them. Um, so that's why we're not seeing very many artifacts because they're not necessarily villages, they're not, you know, it's just kind of, they're using these places as they move across the desert. Um, I think, you know, there's some problems with that that, you know, we, we can think about. Like if you have a nine square mile area, why do you need 500 of them if you're just using them to like to, to sleep in and then moving on? Um, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly what the population was, but it seems like a lot of people <laughs> that you need um, 500 of them in such a small area. Um, in the in the 70s, some people thought they they were habitation areas, especially those kind of inner the ones that are connected to each other. It's like, oh, you have all these different rooms for your house, and here's a side room. So people are kind of thinking like, okay, that, but then again, like I said, there's no habitation <laughs> um, artifacts. Um, other theories are kind of related to ritual. Um, maybe they're meditation areas. Like I said, they're, they're high up. You have these amazing views. They're a good size to sit in comfortably. Um, I think another one of those would be still kind of like, why do you need so many? But then there could be taboos against um, people using the same circle. So that might be a good reason for why you'd have so many of them, because maybe part of that meditation is making your own circle. Um, another theory thought is, is maybe they're a type of geoglyph. So here we have two geoglyphs in the park. Um, the one is a, a snake geoglyph. It kind of just looks like a trail, but when you get up in the air, you can kind of see it has a head and a, and a body and it ends, so not a trail. But So we have a snake geoglyph. Um, so geo, the, the geoglyphs that we have in Anzabrego are primarily in taglios. So what that means is they're created the same way the cleared circles are, by moving the rocks out of the way um, and creating an image in that empty space. Um, the other one on this side is possibly some sort of human figure. We're not really sure, but it kind of has like a, a head and one leg and maybe holding a staff of some sort. But anyway, so you can see these two geoglyphs. They're mostly visible from the air um, and they're kind of, rocks have been cleared away so you can see these images and the space they left behind. Um, so we see circles and other art um, in this part of Anzabrego um, on potsherds. We see circles on, drawn on pots on potsherds. We have um, uh, um, a pictograph. No, sorry, a petroglyph that um, is two interconnected circles. 
So we see this motif used in art. Um, so in kind of with that, with the drone photography, that's helping us a little bit more, kind of mapping the circles and seeing their relationship with each other, getting up above and seeing where they are. Also, like I was saying, you'd be surprised. You're walking by them and you don't see it, and then you kind of get an overview and you're like, oh, yeah, it's, that's, those aren't just two rocks together. Those are a group of rocks in a circle. Um, and then the other thing to think of for and we see this again in rock art is the dots representing like constellations maybe and stars. So this definitely needs further looking at and further study. Um, they're quite a mystery to us. <laughs> um, so those are a couple of theories. And like I said, hopefully from, you know, you have an idea of the a description of what they look like, what sort of artifacts are found around them, what we've tried already. Um, so hopefully you all can think about this and maybe brainstorm a little and then, yeah, send me your ideas on what, the, what are these rock circles used for. <laughs> uh, that's the end. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. you find these circles uh, other places and the man Yep. So you find them um, to the, the east of us and kind of going up the Salton trough. And then um, even out towards uh, like Arizona as well. So they're pretty much all, they're all over the deserts. Yeah. Well, the person who canceled from Death Valley was going to talk about rock circles. Really? Oh, that would have been so interesting seeing the comparisons. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I was just I, you know I I feel like we need more people who know about the circles and can start brainstorming what they're used for. I'm like the better. <laughs> yeah. So one third of the speakers are about the rocks and the pyramids, you know, and the meaning and the history. And Michael Tellinger, he does the work about the rock circles in Africa, and he his theory, and um, I hope I'm paraphrasing it somewhat correctly, is that uh, their rock circles, which they also discovered from higher up, were uh, had they're not saying these are. They measured the electromagnetic energy in them. Oh, how interesting. OK. Yeah, and then his, you can look it up. Um, and he's a speaker on YouTube. Kind of uh -huh. desert, and that they, they theorize it, too. They mystify, too. Like, either that it was to preserve food. OK. Because of, uh, and they actually measured with different instruments, finally, and gave these readings. And uh -huh. this is his body of work. And then the idea that they could be in sequences that that could create a link of the electromagnetic energy. Okay, I'm going to have to look into that. I've never heard that. Yeah, That's so the interesting. Other ones who have theories are the megalithomaniacs. Okay. <laughs> and they're a lot of fun because they make a living taking people like us on tours <laughs> out of these places that we can speculate on site. <laughs> And then they uh, also talked a lot about the Beckley Tepe, which you know is probably the oldest now predated anything we know, though it's been closed by the Turkish government, and its sequences of circles and then unknown rectangles within rectangles. Oh, okay. Will make your life even more mysterious. Yeah, we have, we, I, I left them out of this. We do have like, three or four rectangles, and I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they switched it up all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're <clears throat> spread across pretty much the whole southern part of the park. Um, they are, like I said, on on higher ridges. So they do seem to have a little bit of elevation with good vistas. 
but other than that there's nothing really there's not water near all of them um, there, some of the areas have agave but some of them don't um, it just depends on like so we get them in like heavy desert pavement areas which don't have very much agave um, at least in Anza Borrego the areas but then we also get them on these um, kind of the edges of the the mountains in the park um, like where they're meeting with the valleys and they're kind of a couple of step terraces down to the valley floor which um, does have like agave and more plants and more food resources um, there's not as much water up on those higher places um, and they're spread across the whole terraces so even though some of them might be on the edge of a wash where there is water down below oh sorry then they kind of go and they spread further out as well where they're not near any of those places with water so it's something to think about but I ha they're just so ubiquitous across like the whole the whole park I think it'd be hard to narrow it down to one to one resource Yes. Um, yeah, definitely. We find trails in between them, and then they're, well, I think that's one thing. We Trails are almost everywhere in the park, so we're fine, you know. So, yes, I would say they're along travel routes, and even some of them we find, you know, they're up above, and then we have these, uh, you know, just below kind of on the the very base of the hill, we'll find, like, village pretty heavily used village sites with all of that habitation material I was talking about. Um, and yeah, but they, most of them are definitely a long route, so it could be related to that sleeping circle theory of maybe they're just stops on the way. Um, they're kind of spread out as well, so I w they're not in lines themselves. They're definitely kind of like spread out across the whole valley. Whereas like the trails we see, you know, at least when we see them are just the one kind of singular across. Okay. So I assume there's no pattern in the circle, like you know, some kind of direction indication or anything, but anything's ever noticed, right? Not that we've noticed. I mean, I think that's one thing that's exciting about the drone photography that we've been doing is because I think getting that aerial view, you will, we will start to see maybe patterns if there are patterns. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And you said there was no, there's hardly any Olympics? Not very many. But some? Um, every once in a while we come across, like I'd say in the nine mile area, um, we find, uh, yeah, like, I'm trying to think of like how to put it in terms. So we have like one site, we recorded 50 plus circles and we found like 15 quartzite flakes or cores. So the, it's definitely disproportionate. And it's in an area that has a lot of natural quartzite cobbles itself. So it's like, okay, is that a procurement area for, yeah. And nothing, and no like tools like you know none of them were like yeah this is a scraper this is it was mostly like just some cores and some flakes that might have been used but didn't have any definitive like use wear pattern or shaping that would be like oh yeah this is this kind of tool I don't think they have entrances I think it's a missing rock yeah most of them are enclosed Um, I know that there are some there, so that's one. I got like four. Okay. Um, how the ones that are like multiple together are they anywhere close to where like like oh like could have been? If so, could they be like fishing fish traps? Okay. Um, and then the other weird ones, which are totally weird, since you're saying they're on trails, could they be signposts or poles? <laughs> okay so fish traps some of them are along Lake Kauia but a lot of them aren't 
Um, and they, uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's no real good entrance to like kind of, like even if you were hunting rabbit or something and you're like shooing them into a place, there's no real place for them to go into. Um, so I'd say they don't fit fish traps. Hunting blinds, they're not tall. I mean, granted you could use vegetation to build it up and that could also be said for, you know, if you're, you need, you're using it for a structure and something and the rocks around are just that support for the vegetation. But I mean, like we're talking like this, this tall for the, for the kind of like mysterious rock circles that we don't know. Um, and then the hunting blinds I've seen are, they're normally like, you know, this tall. So it's comfortable to duck behind them. And then toll booths, um, could be. <laughs> I mean, they're good to, they're, like I said, they're comfortable to sit in. So it'd be a good place to sit for a couple hours. Like they're not all along trails. It like, I would say the majority of them aren't along like the defined trails that we see. Um, but they are in air, you know, they are, either we see the trail or there are a, lo a lot of them are along areas that we know a lot of people traveled, but then they're spread out, you know, a couple miles from the, from the trail, you know, so. It would depend on the plant. Um, I'd expect to probably be able to see a little bit in creosote um, because it is such a long. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't think they're, so I don't think those plants are long enough. I don't think they live long enough for them to still be there. And I can't think of a footprint they leave on the landscape that you would be able to identify. We do have ockatillo fences, right. but they're like the, but they're like the last hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe they're pens for something, but why do you need 500 of them? <laughs> I know, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the lack of ceramics is important. It could, yes. It could be greater than 1,000, but wouldn't there be plants growing inside this circle if it was 1,000 years? No. Since they were clear? Um, I don't necessarily think so. I guess it depends on how much time there's spending in the circle so it's kind of like you know if when we live on a surface and we're compacting it it's less hospitable to plants and then also um oh what was my thought it's more compacted and then the other thing is the desert you know it doesn't grow super fast so things don't overgrow so they could be overgrown. yeah and we do have and we definitely have some that have like um I've never seen one with an ocotillo in the center, but I've seen them with smaller bushes. Yeah, so we do see some vegetation growing in them, but I think, like I said, if they're if they're compacted, you know, you would expect it to take longer for plants to take hold. But yeah, I I think they're older. I just don't have any I don't have any <coughs> evidence to, for why I think they're older, <laughs> except that we don't see pottery. <laughs> and I think one other thing is, um, granted, you know, there was a lot of you know, genocide, and we lost a lot of knowledge from the name here because of that. But we also don't have any ethnographic information or anyone in the current community saying that these were being used, you know, recently, at least for, like I said, the rock circles and not the, the rock houses we do, but the rock circles we don't. So that also kind of, you know, it's like, was that, is that knowledge lost because it's so old or is that knowledge lost because everyone was killed? So that's something to think about. 
Is it easy to distinguish between cleared circles and depressions made by bighorn sheep? I've never seen a bighorn sheep depression, so I, I don't know. Um, I was on a hike up the yeah. pass, and, and the person leading the hike pointed out some areas and, and said that they were made by bighorn sheep. Okay. I would say, and I, this is kind of the same thing I said with the creosotes making cleared circles. I think, cleared, I think a lot of cleared circles are misidentified. Um, and I think it's probably similar, but I've worked in areas with burrows, and they also kind of make cleared circles, and it's like, well, these are, these are burrows. So I, but I, in general, my feeling is that cleared circles are most likely natural. <laughs> The rock ring, I think, yeah, the rock ring, um, and we, that's why we use the term rock circle versus cleared circle. So the rock circle is definitely man-made. Cleared circles, you have to be real careful in your identification of those. Is there like a prevailing school of thought on like whether it's, whether they're for spiritual or practical purposes? Because it seems like 500 in like such a small, would be like spiritual. Like this is a holy place. Yeah. And this is my circle. Like, yeah. This is my spot of the holy place. Um I I don't know that there's a consensus. But I don't I think if you talk to any archaeologist they'd probably have a different theory or like me have five different theories and I I don't think anyone knows for sure. Um and there's you know there's probably you probably have for like research papers on these, you probably have about 50-50 people talking about it for ritual and and the other half talking about it as like the sleeping circles or gravel mining or something like that. Is there any commonality in the type of rock? Like or any uniformity or clue that make the circle? No, they're not using like only quartzite or only this and then even like the different areas they're just kind of using the rocks that are are nearby which is I think kind of leads to also the idea of it's like these rocks were in my circle and now I've moved them to the side and if I'm moving them to the side I'm gonna arrange them in a, a circle <laughs> so yeah any thoughts that it's like being kept after school if a kid messes up the box? You've got to make 500 of those. Yeah, I yeah I think we see a lot of that. Like it's like, yeah, like oh I don't have anything for you. I need to keep you entertained. Like yeah, go make go make some circles. I've I've heard that theory before on a bunch of archaeology things. It's like oh they just had the kids do that. Yeah. They've ex so they've excavated a couple, and there was and that's the other thing. So they excavated these and like nothing. No, yeah, there's no depth <laughs> to them. <laughs> yeah. You have to invite Michael Tellinger out. I know. Yeah, we'll have to see if there's yeah electric field in them. <laughs> All right, if there's uh, no more questions, then that's everything I had to say. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Haley. Um, and that concludes our lecture series for the day. And thank you so much for attending Archaeopalooza. <laughs>